Thank you. Um, so we're just going to start our fireside chat with Dr. Emtiaz. Um, I think uh, we'll, we'll just make the introduction as we go along. Uh, so please give a big round of applause to Dr. Emtiaz. Thank you. All right. I actually had to make notes before, uh, before inviting her here because of her ex extensive experience, uh, not only in, in, in the field of medicine, but also in biotech as well. So um, Dr. Imtiaz uh, is a, a medical director at Biomarine. Uh, she completed her medical education and training in Pakistan and then moved over to the US. Uh, Biomarine uh, is a biotech company, is a world leader in developing and commercializing biopharmaceuticals for rare diseases driven by genetic causes. So I will do a real quick quiz over here. Does anybody know what a rare disease is? You cannot answer that. You question. cannot. <laughs> <The teacher? clears throat> It's a genetic condition that is not commonly present in, um, in nature. Usually it's a one out of a thousand or a million. It depends on the type of uh, an anomaly that happens. Um, yeah. All right, that's good. Yeah, <clears throat> it's less than, the incidence should be less than 7%. So that's really- So any disease really that impacts less than 7% of the world population, I would say is considered as a rare disease, just, just a very generic definition of a, what a rare disease is. I want, to keep, I want you to keep that definition in the back of your mind, because as we go along in this, you will understand Dr. Imtiaz's journey and why she is where she is today, uh, and keeping that in mind. So um, my first question from you is, how did you end up in, in medicine? Okay, so um, a quick introduction about why I came into medicine. I think uh, as a child of the 80s, uh, when you were born in Pakistan, you had a couple of options, uh, being a physician or being an engineer. And I chose to be a physician. Uh, but despite my parents telling me since uh, I can remember that we want our doctor daughter to become a doctor, it was a passion of my own. So I wanted to come into medicine. And, you know, as I think as a lot of uh, individuals growing up in that era, that you just want to make an impact and help people and everything. But biology was an interest to me. And I continued with my passion to come into medicine there. So, yeah. So once you were done with, with, with your education, um, you started your residency at Medical Hospital mm -hmm. in Rawal Pindi. If, um, if anyone, anyone here from Pindi knows? Okay. So you know MH. Oh, you yeah. know I graduated from Rawal Pindi Medical College. RMC. I did my internship in Rawal. Like, now it's called Bain the Motor Center. Right, right. So can you walk us through your experience of doing your residency at Medical Hospital and what it meant back then? Sure. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of time during my Army Medical College days. Um, Army Medical College, that's where I graduated from, is, is known a lot for their good academic uh, curriculum and a lot of training. We have, by default, a lot of patients that you can see because it's, it's just all the armed forces patients and their families. Everybody comes by default to this Army Medical College and their teaching hospitals. So we did have a lot of experience and over there. It, it seemed like, um, you know, you get into a lot of research because you have the patient, the data is there, the pool is there, the patient pool is there. And it's not just the research which is funded by anybody. It's just the research that you're doing by yourself. So you see these patients come in with so many different type of diseases and you want to do, you, there is a new case that you can identify almost every day. So that, that was really a, a very interesting thing for me to look at that, to go through that whole process. And being a college, what it is, it's, you don't have any other extracurricular activities when you are re really uh, learning your medicine there. So that, that was very interesting for me during my time in Army Medical College. And then when it was time for me to do my residency, which is called house job in Pakistan, I decided to do it in hepatology in uh, MH, which is medical hospital, military hospital in Pakistan, in Rawalpindi. And the reason for doing that in hepatology was that 
in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, hepatitis C was an endemic in Pakistan, which was an unfortunate thing. It was not just Pakistan, but a lot of third world countries at that time. Hepatitis C had become an endemic. And the reason was the hygienic conditions of uh, medical care there. So using the same syringes, as if, if anybody has a medical background would know that hep C is a blood transmitted disease, as are like HIV and even hepatitis B. And we as a country had, did not realize that what impact it could potentially cause by using these um, equipments which are not clean. And so barbers, like going to a barber shop and getting a cut from an old blade could potentially expose a patient to hep C. And because of that, keeping that in mind, I wanted to train in hepatology to see what impact of hep C is on these patients, not just these patients and these families. And when I went to uh, do my training in that hospital, I realized that these are young patients who are coming in their early 40s, have been exposed to the virus back when they were 20 year old something. And because this is a chronic disease, it takes about 20 to 30 years to develop into a cirrhotic, which is liver cancer, if, if to, to uh, explain it layman terms would come at that time. And there is nothing available at that time. You can't do anything. You can do a biopsy, prove it, say it's hepatitis C. Sorry, you are in end-stage liver disease. We can't help you. And then they go into palliative care and just pass away in a few months. So th that was really an eye-opening experience. And I started looking at it at from an angle that is it just Pakistan which is going through it or are there other countries which are going through a similar situation? And when you look at, again, I'm talking about these early 2000, 2004, 2005 time, interferon was a dis uh, drug <clears throat> which actually was just approved a few years before here in the U.S. by a company here, which I'm sure a lot of people are aware, Gilead Scientists, uh, Sciences and Foster City. And it had revolutionized everything about us, about hepatitis C care. So if a patient is diagnosed with hep C and you give them interferon, it's like treating a disease. It's you decrease the risk of developing into an end-stage liver disease. And back in Pakistan, it was so tough to get that drug for these patients because, again, 90% of the patients would present with an end-stage liver disease. So even the drug could not help them. So that, that was, I think, my first taste of what, uh, how huge an impact can be if you work at an organization where you have the resources to impact, uh, make an impact at a bigger scale, not just per patient, but at a bigger scale. And that, that really was an experience for me from a uh, military hospital in, in uh, Rawalpindi. And after doing that, I moved to my surgical residency, which was in KRL, and again, Fortunately or unfortunately, the 2005 earthquake had come at that time, uh, and <clears throat> the, the situation there was extremely dire. I think my house job, the day I started, the next day was the earthquake. And we could see these piles of patients in a truck, piles upon piles upon piles of these patients coming in because there was everything in the northern areas was destroyed. So all these patients were coming down into the Islamabad, Pindi, Rawalpindi area. And I worked in a hospital which had the resources, but the resources were for 200, 300 patients, not for 20,000, 30,000 patients. And it again makes you feel that even that you, you, how despite having the resources, but not enough resources, you cannot help these patients. And these patients came with blunt fractures, blunt trauma to the body. And we had teams from all over the uh, world coming to help. And there was unfortunately a lot, you know, I'm sure if, uh, I do not know how many of you remember that time or not, but I think we lost up to 200,000 people lost their lives in that earthquake. And it was again, you know, there was an initial impact of the earthquake and then it was the afterwards which led to a lot of uh, loss of life. And all these things, I think somehow or the other, if I look at myself right now, were convincing me to do something which I can make an uh, impact at a much larger scale, not, not just, you know, doing some clinical practice. Yeah, it must be a quite a... Quite an experience because I, I one of the things when we talk we're talking about and which left an impression on me is can you imagine 
one of those trucks pulling in where we bring in, uh, you know, uh, uh, like cement and instead of cement and logs and other stuff, you have these beds lined on top of one another and there are patients lined up, lying in cement. And in one truck, we have like 40, 50 people and some even passed away along the journey. Yeah. Um, that is the kind of trauma uh, your team was dealing with. 100%, all day long, 24 hours, you would see something like this happening. We would spend days and nights, I know it was during Ramzan, so we would spend from Sehri to Laftari all day long in an operation theater helping these patients. And again, it, you feel helpless at a time because you just, your hands are tied. You want to help, but you can't. So it was a lot of uh, palliative care for those patients, unfortunately, at that time. Right. So now that you have done your residency and you're ready to get your first job, right? And um, for those who don't know Dr. Imtiaz, uh, there's one fun fact. Dr. Imtiaz uh, got into medical college at the age of 16. She graduated when she was 20 years old, so she's the youngest graduate in the history of Army Medical College, a, feat, uh, a record that she still holds to date. So, so now that you graduated, you were on Dean's Honor List throughout the five years you were in medical college. You had raving reviews from all the top uh, um, hospitals that you worked, did your residency from. And Usually, if somebody else is in your shoes, they would like to look at one of the top institutions to work for in the country, right? If I were you, I would rather be looking at Aha Khan, I would be looking at Shifa. You decided to follow a very unusual path and decided to go and work for a leprosy hospital where no other doctor wanted to take a position. Can you walk us through what your decision and how you ended up going there? So... Again, as I said, from my experience in medical school and then from the hepatology and even the earth, it felt like that there are there are a number of uh, patients, unfortunately, that we ignore. It's just because it's not enough. You know, you, you don't want to treat certain conditions because maybe the revenue is not enough. It, it doesn't generate a lot of money or you might not have enough patients to see. And Ravalpindi Leprosy Hospital is, is one of the only hospitals in the northern areas of Pakistan, including like, you know, this uh, Rawalpindi Islamabad, who still dealt with these patients who had leprosy. And not just dealt with them, not just treated them, but treated them with respect. So when I was trying to look at the hospital to do my infectious diseases slash dermatology training and to, to prepare, for my, prepare for my fellowship exams, uh, I came across this and I interviewed here for a position. <clears throat> and what something that caught my eye was that the level of respect that these physicians, there were a couple of uh, physicians from Germany who had spent their whole life in Pakistan treating these patients, had the, that for the patients. It was just mind-blowing to have somebody talk about the patients as if they're their own kids, to say how they have treated and how they have built the futures for these patients and their kids. And uh, again, you know, it, it's not by the end of the day, it's just really how you impact, even if you impact a single person or multiple people, but what kind of impact you create. When you come back after doing a day's work, how good you feel about helping those patients or helping somebody was something that, that really, uh, you know, affected me in, in, in that hospital. And it was an amazing experience. I trained there for a good year before I moved here to the U.S., um, Unfortunately, leprosy is still a huge social stigma, not only in the world, but especially in Pakistan, too. And these patients are isolated. The moment there is a diagnosis of leprosy, although I do want to explain that leprosy is 100 percent treatable, uh, the effects may be long lasting, whatever happens. But it's it, it, although initially it, it can be it is a disease that can, you know, affect uh, transfer from one person to another. But when it's treated, it cannot. It's completely cured. Um, but unfortunately, our people don't know that. They still think that leprosy is a huge social stigma. These patients are completely isolated. They grow. They, they live in very isolated areas. They, most of them don't even have families because nobody wants to, like, you know, marry them or have, they don't have any further education or anything. But in this hospital, what I realized was that 
they had created a huge community for these patients. They were getting married. They had kids who were getting to get full, you know great education, going through these academic, uh, wonderful academic institutions, becoming physicians and engineers and lawyers and coming abroad. And it was great, but there were unfortunate circumstances there too because this hospital was completely funded by the German the German government. Um, and even our the medications that we were giving to the patients for leprosy and because it was also a tuberculosis center were all coming from, not from even Pakistan, they were all coming from India because the medication for these two common diseases was so expensive in Pakistan that for these patients who were doing uh, living on free treatment could not afford it. The hospital could not afford it. So it's just like these experiences that make you think why we are not able to do something and help these patients at a, at a bigger scale. Um, but at the same time, you have people, uh, there was a physician there who we did not know, we did not meet, and he was providing food for these patients for the past 20 years. Every night, cooked food would come in this hospital, which had 250 patients almost, you know, on an, an every day, and they would provide food. So you have two extremes. One, the patient, uh, you, you know, the, the government is not willing to pay to run this government, uh, to, to run this hospital. But then there are people who are willing to pay for the past 20 years to feed these patients. So, you know, this is this is really um, it was eye opening as an experience for me. Amazing. What an amazing story. I, and I, I think that is one thing which I took away from our conversation is that on one side, whereas we don't have the resources and we have these individuals like this particular doctor whom nobody knows. And uh, Dr. Imtiaz tells me there's a truck that comes in the evening full of food that just every day without fail, it just comes in. They just download, uh, sorry, they pick up the food, they lay it for all the patients and they feed every day for 250 patients on a daily basis and nobody knows who's been providing it from that. Um, I also did a little bit search on the leprosy hospital as well. So just a fun fact, it's one of the oldest hospitals in Pakistan. It was created in 1904 by the British government and people who, leprosy patients used to live in the outskirts of Pindi, very far away from Pindi because they could not interact with the local population. So the British government established it. The land for this hospital was donated by the family of uh, the, the Emperor Hamayu had a wazir whom he allocated land around Pindi. So and up till until that point, the family owned the land and they donated it to uh, the British. And then when Pakistan was made, that family still held the land and they donated the, the rest of the remaining land also came from that that particular uh, family. So it's it's in the records of. Uh, Royal Pindi Municipal, you know, government land records. Um, they also have a place in uh, in Sawat, I think. Yeah, in, in Kahan Naran area. That's where most of the leprosy patients would live. So, as tuberculosis, leprosy is a disease caused by a bacteria, mycobacterium, which does not survive in colder areas. So, these patients, whenever they would get diagnosed, they would send them to um, higher altitudes so they can have a better chance of survival. Uh, so, they have a huge, you know, again, organization up in the Kahan Naran area where they have built housing for these patients too um, right. with medical care. And the entire hospital is being run by German nuns who have dedicated their lives, their lives to for, helping, yeah, helping these 30, people. 30, 40, 50 years they have been here. They come here and they, you know, live the whole life here. So. so now that you were working in leprosy, you had an opportunity, you came to the U.S. and um, you decided that now that now you're in the US, you had much more opportunities to look forward to. In Pakistan, there were limited opportunities. So you decided to go into research and you ended up in University of Southern Illinois. How did that opportunity materialize and it played a role in your career? Uh, <clears throat> so I, I you know, played a googly hair completely because everybody who graduates medicine and comes here to the uh, states, they give their USMLEs and go, you know, do their residency training and end up practicing clinical medicine. Um, and I decided to go into clinical research um, from the get-go, from the moment I came here. And I tell you, 99 of the 100 people I told this plan to said, whoa, no, that, that's really a bad idea. You should 
definitely not give up on being a doctor. So I'm actually not giving up on being a doctor. I'm making my expertise go into research. You know, I think that's a great, no, the, the support was absolutely not there except for a couple of people who definitely did support me um, through through this career change. And I was looking for opportunities for in, in research. And I, uh, you know, we were in Illinois at that time. And I reached out to this uh, physician, Dr. Neumeister, who's a very well-known plastic surgeon in um, the U.S. And he was uh, initiating a trial of using Botox. I'm sure everybody has heard the word Botox, but in patients who had Raynaud's phenomena. So the Raynaud's phenomena is a disease in which because of usually it affects people in colder regions, their vessels in their hands, the blood vessels, they get constricted and it hurts a lot. It pains. And then these patients can, unfortunately, sometimes this can lead to gangrene and loss of fingers too, if it's in extreme conditions. Now, if you are in Illinois, which is a extremely cold region, and there are a lot of uh, farmers there. So those patients would be the most ones affected and that could affect their day-to-day -day work, uh, you know, uh, to, a, to a huge scale. So I interviewed with him for this particular position, and I told him my background and why I was interested in it. And, you know, the position was to lead as this as a clinical trial into the clinic, bring it to the patients and see. And we only had to enroll, I think, 25 patients in this trial to see if it works and then submit an IND to um, FDA to see if, you know, we can get an approval for this as a rare indication. And the luck was with me on that day. Uh, he agreed, and I got the position, started working there uh, initially for this, and then eventually I worked there for two years um, and got exposed to multiple other uh, indications such as oncology. Breast oncology was one of his passions there too, to see patients who have uh, stage four or progressed cancer, which they don't have any other options see what other medications could, you know, we could do clinical trials on there. So I spent two years there in Southern Illinois University. And then I ended up moving here to California, um, again, looking through the clinical research lens and trying to do into a little bit of a rare disease lens. Um, I came here to Stanford and started working with uh, a really uh, great physician there too, but in neuro-oncology. So I uh, don't know if anybody is aware, there's a brain cancer, lot, lots of different types, but glioblastoma is the most fatal one. Unfortunately, the expectancy of that cancer is 15 months for anybody who's diagnosed and a five-year uh, life expectancy is only 3%. So it was something that, again, uh, the reason I chose that was because there's <clears throat> really not only this disease doesn't only affect one patient, but it affects the whole family for that particular patient because there is just hopelessness for the time the patient passes away. Um, and, you know, we were doing these multiple trials um, within Stanford to and from with the help of the industry to um, unfortunately, I would say that there was nothing at that time which could prevent any of this or help these patients, uh, you know, uh, with their lifetime expectancy. But there was a lot of learning there, a lot of learning that how um, the word hope to a patient can mean so much. You know, if you can just say that maybe, maybe we don't know, but maybe there is a there is a thirty percent chance or a twenty percent chance that this drug will work, that patient would go home feeling that they have won a lottery. They, they feel like we can do something, you know, there is something to look forward to. Um, and that was some, you know, a great experience for me at Stanford, uh, what I learned. I think one of the things when we were talking about this, which I admire is that you told me, never be afraid to ask. Had you not picked up the phone and called Dr. Newmister, you would have never gotten that opportunity at Southern Law University. You wanted to go somewhere you made sure that you did your research and you just reached out and that it, made, it helped. I, yes, absolutely. I think there is no, uh, you should never be shy. There will, you'll ask a hundred people and only one or maybe a thousand and only two will say yes to just a simple request. Uh, if, if you are passionate about something, there is no shying about it. Either you do it with a hundred percent commitment or you don't do it because there is no middle way of maybe let me try it, see if it works. If not, then I can always have a backup. If you want something, you just go 
completely 100% towards it. And you use the same approach when we you were coming to California, you reached out to Stanford and you reached out to UCSF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, long ago in those days, I thought academic research is, is the answer to all questions. Uh, but, you know, after spending a few years in academic research, I did realize that your hands are tied. You're always asking for money from other people to help with uh, research. Brilliant minds there. You learn a lot. But again, you cannot do it at a scale that you want to do it. You can't go and, you know, get everything that that's a, that's really a thing everybody who gives you money in an academic institution they by the end of the day they want okay where did you spend my money how is it like where did this dollar go where did that dollar go so your hands do get tied in academic research as great as it is i think you know everything great comes out of these academic institutions but after a while everybody needs to just spread their wings and figure out uh, mm -hmm. to get so you money. decided to join the other dark side no, no, no. I say that that's the light at the end of the tunnel. I joined, decided to join industry where my hands were a little free. <laughs> I wasn't tied down. Um, and I ended up again into that rare disease um, which I was going through. I decided to join this company called Veracide, which is a diagnostic company which was using artificial intelligence. Um, I think, as, as Amin mentioned, this is a new thing coming in biotech, but I can tell you, you know, this has been in medicine for decades now. And that company where I worked, it was a diagnostic company which was using machine learning to decrease invasive procedures to diagnose cancers, certain type of cancers, and other um, rare diseases like interstitial lung disease, which have, has different types of lung diseases in there including uh, IPF, uh, which is a pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so, yeah, I joined Veracide there uh, and worked in their capacity as a, as a medical director there, too. So can you walk us through your journey from Veracide, now that you're part of the industry, and then you came over to Biomarine? Mm -hmm. And in Biomarine, really, your career was fast-tracked because of all your experiences from the past. Can you walk us through a little bit? Sure. Biomarin was an easy choice, again, because I think it, at the time when I joined Biomarin, we had, there were a handful of uh, rare disease companies. You could count them on one hand. Now there are multiple more companies coming up, startups, especially going into rare diseases. And by, at, at the time when I joined Biomarin, they had uh, a couple of products for MPS, which is, again, a uh, uh, a genetic disease of uh, accumulation of fatty acids. And then we were working on a disease called achondroplasia, which is a skeletal dysplasia. Um, and uh, Amir can, you know, knows more about it than I can ever explain. But it's a disease which impacts, it's a genetic mutation, um, which is, which can affect kids. And they end up um, having skeletal, different types of skeletal dysplasia. And we were Doing, Biomarin was doing this uh, trial um, for these patients, and we they were just going into infants at that time. And I had interviewed, I looked at this company, and they had reached out to me. Um, and when I came, and they had uh, asked me which product do I want to join in if I if I given the opportunity, and I'd selected this one because they were leading it in. Um, for young, for two and older, for kids at that time, two and older. And I had said yes to this position. It's, again, everything boils down to the experience that you've had in your medicine, in your training, and all the other academic institutions is how really you you want to help. Um, again, I'm not the only one helping. It's a huge team. It's a whole huge organization. But just to be part of that organization into helping the patients uh, and the families, uh, with, you know, who are um, have these diseases. Achondroplasia, I don't think, is a disease. I would say it's a condition. But Biomarin was working with several other diseases, which are very rare, and coming with these new technologies like gene therapy, which is huge um, right now. And we can talk a little bit about it. Uh, it's something that, you know, it hasn't been done, but it wasn't done before in, in treating conditions. And fast forward five years, we have gene therapy approved for several conditions right now, including blood disorders and uh, neurodegenerative disorders, which also affect these, unfortunately, kids, uh, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'm sure some people have heard about it. It affects particularly uh, males, 
kid uh, boys young boys and they don't live more than 12 years of age so those are the and, you know we are also working on on that disease right now so that was really uh, i think a very easy straightforward jump for me to come to biomarin uh, right. as a rare disease company so when you started your career you know things were a little bit different um and how patients were being treated medicines how have things evolved in the past two decades oh so much i think and again um if i were to do medicine right now i don't think the books that we used back in my early 2000 are even being used right now uh, i i'll give you a very simple example if you had a patient come in with um headache when i was doing my house job you would just write him a prescription of tylenol and say or acetaminophen or paracetamol as it's known in pakistan and say this is it and you know you're done and now it's all about personalized medicine you you will do all this research and finding out oh maybe let me look at the factors which are causing your headache maybe your headache is different than the headache that the other patient patient a's headache is different than patient b's headache and let me treat the patient a's headache with ibuprofen and patient b's headache with tylenol because both of these although have a similar way of uh, mechanism of action but will affect different types of uh, cells in the body so that's how pers- medicine has become personalized extremely like with all these genomic sequencing and learning about all these signals and signal detection it's it's very very personalized it's very different than how we trained um and it's you know again physicians have a lot of catching up to do on how medicine has evolved in the past decade i would say the past 10 years have been um outstanding for medicine so with that evolution now we have ai mm-hmm. right and everybody seems to be thinking that it's going to be the next genie going to resolve solve our problems how do you think ai is going to impact medicine as i said before ai it's not new for medicine ai has been in medicine for years this uh, i think back in the 60s is when genomic sequencing started on how to separate human genome sequence and that used ai um and fast forward into the 90s to we used ai machine learning for everything for signal detection to understand i think what i mean was also referring to the trends you know if your heart rate is going up what is happening to your blood pressure all of this had some element of ai in there um it definitely will improve covid vaccine is a very good example of how ai helped in coming up with this vaccine you know quickly because it was already a known technology this is an mrna vaccine everybody knew about mrna vaccines so it was a known technology and ai definitely helped fast forward this uh, approval process with the agency uh, but i think again as i said ai has been with medicine for years it is going to definitely help with um, looking at the data more holistically more cleanly but how it might affect um in drug discovery or drug approval is is still it has to be seen i would say the drug, you know you cannot expedite the way how the patients respond just because of ai so if you need to collect long term data you need to collect long term data ai cannot expedite that but i think it will definitely help with the with the uh, looking at the data more holistically all right so i'm going to ask one last question before we open it up you work with regulators all around the world you wor- work with fda in the us you work with pmda in japan and ema in europe um and korea and other countries how do those conversation differ from one regulator to the other so fda is the holy grail i think for a lot of these uh, <clears throat> agencies fda and ema um they the the work of the agencies the purpose of having these agencies to make sure that the drug which is getting approved is very safe for the patient so if all these agencies are going to do everything to make sure that the data that you have presented and the drug uh, the safety profile and the efficacy profile is is the best for the patients and because we have had examples and you know these examples happen every day now unfortunately in where there is manipulation of the data to get some drug approved or later on 20 years after the drug has been approved they find out that there is some effects that the drug is causing that's why we collect the long term safety data too so there are a lot of question answers that to happen and somehow the other fda always thinks about pharmaceutical companies with a 
you know, the relationship is very bittersweet. Uh, they don't like pharma that much, but at the same time, they appreciate pharma for doing all the research. So it's, a you know, but what I've realized is that if you have approval from FDA and EMA, the other agencies do give you that a uh, uh, little bit of the benefit uh, in terms of approval process. They'll ask you a lot of questions, but they definitely will side uh, with the company if, if you have approval from these two bigger agencies. I thought you said something very fun when we were having this conversation. FDA will send you a question one day before you're going on leave or your holiday. <laughs> EME, other countries, they will send you a question after you come back from the holidays or after there's Christmas we vacation. We just want to ruin well. your vacation. So that's a, that's a distinction she said. And I think that's mostly our, our American way of working is that we never stop. So with that, we'll open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions, please feel free. Two related questions, so I'll just say that. So, you know, why 7% as a... 0.7%, um, I'm sure, yes, at 7, it's 0.7%. Still, but why not a whole number, rounded number like 0.5 or 0.1? You know, there must be something. I, it's, I think, the way, the way they collected the incidence of these patients. So it's it should be less than 0.6 or 0.7% uh, for a disease for it to become a rare disease. And then because, you know, there is these rare diseases, so how is the funding coming? Because, you know, there is no incentive to go after them. So that's who's that's providing a, the funding and how is that? Absolutely. That's a great point. And I think that really leads to the thing that I was trying to say is not a lot of companies do want to do this because the revenue which will be generated from this is so less. So it's just finding the right investors, I would say, you know, people who are willing to invest into a company which will do all this funding. Biomarin, for example, got very lucky. We had these big investors who invested in the company. One thing about the rare disease is that once your drug is approved, you do find a lot of money to, um, you know, when you're treating these patients, the revenue does start becoming pretty significant for uh, for the company to do research into further rare diseases. And I'll give you an example. The hemophilia gene therapy, which is just approved, also Biomarin's hemophilia gene therapy, uh, we spent, and this is all public record, uh, we spent millions and millions and millions of dollars doing the research on this particular, um, particular condition. And the it's the treatment initially um, right now for patients who are hemophilia. Hemophilia is a bleeding disorder in which a little bit of trauma can lead to a lot of blood. Is factor eight or emesizumab, which is another drug, which is biweekly that you take this infusion every other week. The current treatment and with this gene therapy, it is one infusion, and you don't need anything for five years or three years, depending upon how the patients would. And so the price for that would definitely add all the infusions that you're taking for factor eight and emicizabab. So that one injection would be worth that much amount of money. So I won't disclose what the price will be. Um, I still want that job at my company. So, um, but again, that will create enough revenue for these. Uh, and also for these research, are you getting side benefits of other things that you discover while you're doing the research. Absolutely, absolutely. You always, research is always like that. You're, sometimes you're trying to find a cure for disease A, but you end up finding a cure for disease B. Um, you know, that that's the beauty, especially with this genomic sequencing. Hey, uh, I have a question. Uh, you guys are doing, uh, this disease might not be rare from like, you know, F FDA and AIDS standards, but in Pakistan, like kind of one of the things which I get to encounter, even though I don't practice any medicine these days, or like, you know, is th thalassemia, the major thalassemia. And like, you know, are you guys doing anything in that regard so that Pakistan can get some trickle down effect? Yeah. We are not as a company right now for beta, I think you're mentioning for beta thalassemia. Beta thalassemia yeah. is like kind of mixed life. Like yes, uh, absolutely. But I know there are some companies who are doing not uh, specifically gene therapy for it, but they're doing um, other other sort of uh, research on that, which would potentially could impact um, these patients. Uh, with especially, I think they're trying to prevent the iron overload, which I'm, you know, if, if you don't know, beta thalassemia is a disease in which patients have anemia. These, this is also a genetic disease. And the treatment for this is infusions, blood uh, and transfusion. And unfortunately, then the iron in the blood 
it builds up in the body and then it goes to these different organs like liver and unfortunately these patients pass away because of not the beta thalassemia but the right. iron overload. So there are companies who have come up with these medications which decrease the bind to the iron, which I'm sure they're also using in Pakistan, but not as such as a cure for beta thalassemia. Yeah, they're, so. they're like traditional chelating agents. Exactly, yeah, yeah, but not as uh, at a bigger scale for now. Thank you for sharing your story. Of course. It's an amazing journey that you had. Uh, um, and interesting transition from medical, uh, like more patient focus to like research. Uh, and it seems like you got the taste of research early on while you were in Pakistan. Um, going back, like someone new coming into the field, would you recommend to them, like, hey, go become a doctor and then come into uh, a research? Like, how that side has have helped you? Uh, at the Absol time Absolutely. I think uh, I am what I am because of my medical background. I still, I'm able to talk to physicians. I'm able to talk to these key opinion leaders, write a lot of research papers because of my medical background. I would probably not be doing anything if I had not done through the journey. Um, and I do want to give this advice to people who are coming into medicine is that it's, you have multiple pathways when you do your medical degree. It's not just going practicing clinical medicine. You know, you can also teach, but clinical research and coming into research is a huge opportunity which not a lot of people avail and because of that unfortunately I work for a company which has over you know almost 4,000 employees and I am the only Pakistani doctor in in there in research which is not that you know I'm anything special but I'm just saying because the pe people don't realize that there is a another opportunity for you know uh, physicians to grow here and, and you get to do so much you get to become an expert in a disease every day you can start, like I worked with achondroplasia, read everything about uh, disorders, which were skeletal dysplasia. I'm doing hemophilia. I'm becoming a hematologist today. I'm doing another disease, which is an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I'm going to become a pulmonologist tomorrow. So all these things, they just keep you running and thinking and, you know, excited about what, what's next in the journey. Yeah, and I can hear the excitement in your voice. Mm. Going back to like in Pakistan, at that time, maybe the opportunities weren't there. Do you think that has changed a lot? Uh, like I, I can. Def I do not know about the research opportunities in Pakistan. Have they changed or not? Unfortunately, because of the lack of this, the system, the, we don't have that uh, for these big pharma companies to go in Pakistan and run a trial. Uh, but saying that we have some great minds who are trying to create this data pool of patients and bring that data here and show it to the world that, hey, you know, you want this to learn about this disease. We have the patients, you know, we are the sixth most populous country in the world. Of course, we have enough patients for whatever disease you want to look at. So why don't you come and do, you know, those trials there? But I, I do know we have a lot of papers coming out of Pakistan, these case histories and, you know, uh, publications with the physicians who are trying to bring this to an international scale to see, you know, we have the, we, I worked with, I spoke with a physician who is doing, who is a pediatrician and doing these MPS, as I said, it's a fatty acid disorder. And we have so many, because of the inter uh, marriages in Pakistan, those diseases are very common in Pakistan. And Biomarin was struggling to find the patients. And in Pakistan, even if we just went to Pakistan, we could have all the patients that we wanted for the trial. And that, that's the level of uh, uh, data that we have. So, you know, I, I would love to make every effort for the companies to realize that they should go to Pakistan and help and, and definitely also create opportunities for people like me who want to come into research. So let's say a company did want to go do a clinical study in Pakistan. How would do the different certifications play in FDA, CE? What are, what are your thoughts on like how you could get that medicine into the U.S. <clears throat> or don't even bother with the U.S. and just go to the worldwide with the CE? What are your thoughts on that? No, if uh, that's a great question. If they want to go into Pakistan to do a clinical trial, then of course it has to go through the Pakistani regulatory authority. The problem, the issue, which I think, you know, we have had discussions before to which we have come across is that we don't have any enough systems in place um, 
And I'll give you an example. If you go to Japan, they have their own regulatory agency called PMDA. And they have all these systems in place in which when a company wants to bring um, uh, their trial into, into Japan, they have the CROs who are going to conduct the trial to make sure that the data that is collected is authentic. The patients are coming. The compliance of the patient is there. The drug will be administered under supervision. There will be no, as I and most of the people will understand, hera fairy there. You know, it will. The genuine product will go to that patient. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, we don't have those systems in place. We don't have these organizations who will commit to this uh, to the pharma industry here that, hey, bring it, and we'll take care of everything. Um, I know we are trying. We have, like, our Khan has this wonderful pool now of data that they've collected all across Karachi in cardiology, for example, and they're trying to make a database for these patients. But... Do, you know, at an individual hospital, maybe we have it, but it's at the national scale is what you need is a, a proper system uh, for, for trials to run. It's maybe a little controversial, so please don't take it the wrong way. So when you, uh, if there's a third world country, right, when you're doing research, I mean, are you willing to take more risks because the regulatory environment is not there and those people could be treated more as expendable in some way? Or how do you maintain that ethics? And um, That's a great question. I think that's a huge thing for research, ethics and all these, uh, you know, if you go back and start looking at these regulations that came for research come from unfortunate incidents in which research was done at patients where they were not even consented. Yeah. So it's it's a very difficult balance to find. And I'll give you an example. We did visit an African country. Again, I would not disclose any name or anything where we did find a lot of patients which for a disease that we were looking for. And we, as um, you know, to, and we had this one physician who was actually based out of England, but his home country was that um, African country. And he wanted us to bring that particular disease or a trial to that country to see if we can have these patients come in, because there's so many uh, of them. And, you know, you can, both the parties could benefit. And the patient said no. The patient said no, because they said, you guys are using us as, as a, you know, really, you're not, we are not going to be, you're not going to treat us the same way you treat a patient from UK or you treat a patient. From, um, and it, it's it's true. It's absolutely true because you, when you don't have the systems in place, a company can go and do whatever they want to as because they're collecting the data and everything. Uh, so it, it's tough to find, it's very tough to find that balance. But saying that, we do go into a lot of these developing nations. You know, we have trials running in, India and certain African countries and Bangladesh, and um, but it's a, it's the commitment that you need from from the government to say that you know whatever they're going to do, the systems and are going to be in place for it to run. But it's it's a very controversial topic, for sure. So to follow up on that question, um, I've actually experienced um, cancer care for my husband with over ten years time, and he went through several tests and several clinical trials. One of the things that we learned was that you could be that, you know, out of the 20 or 30 patients, you could be the patient that was actually responding positively to a drug trial, but then because of the data that was collected and the failure, it's picked out and you're basically left with nothing. How do you handle that nowadays with, with such accuracy of data and, um, you know, with, with FDA approval and being a physician? Is there any say where you have, uh, you know, say even the company? <clears throat> Um, no, it's it's a sad thing to say, but that's how it is. So, you know, when we design a protocol and when we send, uh, we have to send a package to the FDA before we even start a trial. And that lays down certain parameters, your primary efficacy points, your secondary efficacy and primary safety. And then you define what it means to be a successful trial. And if the successful trial means that out of 100 patients that you enroll, and I'll give you an example for, for oncology particularly, you say that in the 100 patients that we are going to enroll, we are going to in, improve their life expectancy or survival rate from, if it is one year to two years. And that will happen in 50% of the patients. And if you don't meet that, then it's it. 
even the 30 patients, they did respond. They did end up living to two years, but you did not meet your primary endpoint. The agency will come back and say, you didn't meet it. Unless, unless there is a disease in which there is nothing available, absolutely nothing, then the agency will, they might, they might give you an option to revise your um, primary endpoint and say, sure, you know, for, for patients where there is nothing, there is an option for this particular uh, medication. Otherwise, it's very tough to convince the agencies and, and to convince the, the investors, to invest, to convince the company in itself, because if, if the impact is for a handful of patients, they would not want to go pursue unfortunately with that. So FDA is still the roadblock. It takes like seven FDA years. And, and also the money, it's the monetary part too, right? It, uh, by the end of the day, everybody wants to make some something out of it. So if it doesn't impact the number of patients, unfortunately, it's a sad truth, then they would say no to that. I wanted to follow up on the question about the CE versus the FDA. Like, let's say you're in the, you're, you have a study, a partnership with Ahan University, you know, it's, everything's, you know, in order there. Um, what would you recommend? Would you want to go for a CE so that it could give you, you know, worldwide access, or would you pursue FDA, and if so, why? Uh, I think it's it's going to be, you have to look at all the benefit, pros and cons. People usually prefer the FDA because it, it, the money is here. It comes from here. And again, I'm going to give you a very truthful answer for it. Even if you get a product approved in the U.S., I'm not even talking about in everybody else, everywhere else. When you have a product and you take it to different regulatory agencies like EMA or PMDA or even Canada, the money that comes is very subsidized, right? Because it's the it's the government that is going to pay you. The, the money that comes for these companies comes from insurance companies, which is here at the FDA. So by the end of the day, everybody is going to look for their own benefit eventually, I'm, you know, fortunately or unfortunately for wh whatever you want to use it, but they also have to make money to, for, you know, further the research. Now, if it was me, I would go with a CE so it could be provided worldwide. But if it was a company, I don't think they would choose that route. And it, it sounds like it's mostly on the money side that what I'm hearing is that insurance is, is where the money's at. And that's why as a business, you would want to go. As a business, as a business, because by the end of the day, they have to generate revenue to continue research, right? It's where will the money come from, from to continue with that research? They have to generate some revenue. So what we do at certain companies, which I've worked for, they will target the FDA. And after they have done it from there, then it is you can come and take the drug. Like for even with biomarin, there are certain diseases in which they, they sell the drugs to for complete for humanitarian purposes, free of cost. It goes all around the world. But they just want some continuous stream of revenue coming so they can better the product, continue with the research. And that's, I think, for all businesses, right? You have to survive by the end of the day. Um, I'm curious, like medicines take a lot of money to develop, and then with rare medicines in particular, um, especially with the point of having a new cost and revenue stream, what the attitude towards drug repositioning is. Uh, especially with, you know, computational models are better now, so maybe there, it's easier to find indications or uh, figure out if they could reposition existing medicines and, and how what the attitudes are. So if I understood your question correctly, what you're saying is that with these, of course, AI and everything, you can find what indication you want to go into. How is that going to change the strategy of these companies uh, targeting different indications? Is that what you're uh, asking? So, like drug repositioning, maybe not the best example, but like minoxidil was designed as a heart medication. Right. You can use it topically. Yeah. Topically. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious with rare medicines because people know it's going to be very capital intensive. If there's a attitude where people are more open to say what we have and let's cast a wide net and use some of these other tools to reposition existing things. Right, right. Does that conflict with the industrial like idea of we need to have a product that brings in a, a new product? <laughs> I mean, you know, what you, you gave the example, they did it with the COVID vaccine. That's exactly what the repositioning was. for the, the, It was already existing. The mRNA technology was there. They just changed the viral genome in there and they used it there. I think that that's something, you know, it's, it's already happening. It's not that, and it's benefit for the company too. They don't have to, to invest money to 
uh, start a new trial of a new medication is a long process. It's not an overnight thing. It takes an average time for a drug to be come to the market after discovery is 10 years. Nobody wants to spend that much money if they can reposition or time. Uh, that. So I think that that's something that's been going on with AI. It's only going to help. I don't think that anybody is going to be hesitant in using the existing drugs and for other indications. Although I would say they would still need some time to do the research and collect the long-term safety and efficacy to see if it works, but might as well. Yusuf, you had a question. Yeah, uh, I have a quick question about compassionate use. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts on that and are we doing enough to open it up for anyone? Um, I, I think companies are doing, um, I do not know if they're doing enough or not, but yes, they are doing uh, for quite a bit for compassionate use. Um, bigger companies like uh, Genentech, Roche, and they're, they're doing it at a much larger scale. And I, you know, I had my own experience with them working in um, Stanford for this neuro-oncology too with a drug called Avastin. I do not know if a lot of people are aware with it or not. It's supposed to decrease the blood supply to kill, um, you know, if there is no blood supply potentially would kill the cancer. It doesn't always happen, but it definitely helps. But, you know, one infusion is $40,000. And patients who are paying out of pocket really can't. So they were doing a huge program with compassionate use and sending it all around the world too. That that really if, depends upon the indication, first of all, and then secondly, which, uh, you know, who is reaching out to them. If it's an individual patient, it's a little tough if it's a hospital or a bigger organization which reaches out to these companies, they'll definitely do the compassionate use. If I can add this to, like the hepatitis C treatment in US average was like eighty thousand dollar per year, and in Pakistan, like you know, the same antiviral drugs, like you know, through government of Pakistan and various NGOs, it's like about. Five lakh rupees, which is like uh, maybe three three thousand US dollar. So like, you know, yeah. so things are getting better. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. we th thank you, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, there's one last question here. So sure. Uh, hi. So uh, we have a company in Pakistan which makes peritoneal dialysis machines, and uh, we've developed we're developing a second generation of that which makes dialysis inside the patient's home. So do you know any company which are with any CROs in Pakistan which are familiar with the FDA clearance process and uh, people who, like the special resources, is the center that's grooming them or training them? Because I, I see you're like one of the unique people who came over here and were following the different part. Um, I, I do not know of any CROs. I can definitely look through it and help you. I know there are a couple of CROs who work at the work with Shafa um, Hospital in Islamabad, who are doing these trials with um, um, in a similar way, similar standard which is conducted here. But I don't really know the names of that. We, we can I can you know definitely reach out to you with those names mm -hmm. for sure. So while we were while we were preparing for this interview, I, I think I learned a lot. Um, and and uh, Dr. Imtiaz does not have is not short of uh, instances or stories that you know give you hope that a uh, lot of things can happen in the right direction. Um, one of the stories, which a uh, couple of things we already talked about, one I'll mention here is that. While she was working at Stanford for a geoblastoma clinical trial, mm -hmm. uh, this is a disease that not everybody survives. And there was this one particular patient whom, when they told that there is no chance of survival, decided not to take the treatment anymore. He wanted to go back and spend time with his family back home in India. And, that, and this came as a surprise because that could have significantly impacted and reduced his life if he had discontinued the treatment. But Stanford, being Stanford, absolutely agreed to that and said, all right, on one condition that you keep us posted on things. And uh, despite all odds, it's been uh, how many years? 10, ten years. <clears throat> that patient for the last 10 years, whom they had given three months to live, has yeah. been for the past 10 years reporting to them and uh, they're, they're, that he's, he's doing okay and he's with his family and uh, things really worked out for him. So there are, uh, while, while we were talking, we just came across so many instances that 
motivate you that, you know, hope is one thing that against all odds in instances can work. And the other thing which I learned from Dr. Imtiaz was never be shy to ask. Uh, every time you are in a situation where you don't know the answer, look around and ask, look around for people who have the right skill sets and ask for help. You will be surprised from all the areas it will come from. So with that, I would like to thank Dr. Imtiaz for her time and thank you everyone for listening to me. Thank you.